It's a privilege to just share with you this morning what I believe God had laid upon my heart. So next few minutes, just uh, open your heart and just receive what I believe God wants to give to you. Is that good? Let's pray. Father, we open up our hearts to receive what you want to give. Speak to our hearts this morning, Lord, and change our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, um, you know me by now, I love stories, and i um, like to tell you a story out of the Bible this morning, and we're going to continue on reading through it. This is going to give you a bit of background about this story. Um, it's a story about Nehemiah. Now, I'm sure that all of you have read Nehemiah. You know, if you grew up in church, you know the story of Nehemiah. You are, you know, well aware of what happened with, with his life, but... This morning, I just want to highlight certain things out of the book of Nehemiah that I believe God wants to leave with us, especially in the times that we are living in right now. The background story of Nehemiah is this, that Nehemiah was born and grew up in Babylon, right? He was an exile. His parents was, was exiled, so he grew up in Babylon. He was never known, he never went back to Jerusalem um, he never was there. So, so, so actually, Jerusalem was none of his concern. He was in Babylon. He stayed there. He served the king as a cupbearer, a very important job. If you serve the king as a cupbearer, you always needed to have a smile on your face. You will see that as you read Jeremiah, I don't, uh, uh, Nehemiah. I don't have time to go into this. But as the cupbearer to the king, you always had to be joyful. Imagine having that job, even if you don't feel like it. You've got to be joyful. And so some people came from Judah and Jerusalem, and they shared this message with Nehemiah and saying to him, the people in Judah and Jerusalem are suffering. The walls are broken down. They really struggle. And for a few days, Days, the Bible says, and Nehemiah cried and he, and, he, and, he, and he was before God for the people of Judah. And one day he walked into the king's palace, you know, with the king's appetite, bit of wine. And the king looked at him and he said, hey, what's wrong with you? You look sad. And then you can go and read it in Nehemiah 1. The Bible says, Nehemiah was very afraid. He got very afraid when the king looked at him and said, why are you so depressed? You're in my presence. Why do you look like this? He says, for years you smiled. Why do you look like this now? And suddenly Nehemiah told him the story about his people and about what happened and, and, and how he wants to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls and, and make sure that it is established in his people. People that he's never met in his life. People that he doesn't know of, or, but he knows that he came from them as an exile. And this is where we, we, we pick up the story. So, so, so there's a lot that happened in the first three chapters of Nehemiah that I would love for you just to go and read and just to go and read on the background and the history. But this is in short the story. So Nehemiah got convicted about the situation in Jerusalem and he wanted to go back and he asked the king if the king would help him and support him and off he went to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem to the people of Judah spoke about hope, it talked about security, it talked about wholeness, it talked about prosperity. If the city of Jerusalem was doing fine, the people of Judah were strong. They were happy, they, was, they, they were strong. And so to rush through the book, just to give you an insight of the end of the book, Nehemiah rebuilt the walls in 52 days. Pretty amazing feat. If you can read it, you'll see it. But this morning, I want to focus our attention on a certain part of the story within the story of Nehemiah, within the story of what happened during this time that he went to Jerusalem, because sometimes we get the idea that he went there on the call and the compassion of God and did something and everything was smooth sailing and he did everything as planned and everything went well and he came back and everything was sorted. That's how we want it to end. That's how we want the story to go. But you know and I know in our lives that doesn't work like that. Amen? 
Or do you always experience just amazing things, no opposition, no, you know, just, just awesome stuff? No, we don't. So in Nehemiah chapter 4, we're going to read and then we're going to talk and read and talk as we go along. So in Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 1, we read this. Now when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, Sanballat was an opposition to the people of Judah, right? Uh, when he heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He got so mad because these people are building their own walls. Do you know people like that? He, he got so mad. Now listen to what he says. And he ridiculed the Jews. So he became angry, and I need you to, to just focus on that. He became angry, was incensed, and now he starts ridiculing the Jews. Is that what you do when you are angry and incensed? Start ridiculing. So people that ridicule you, they're actually just angry and incensed. When people say things about you and say things to you, they are just angry. Maybe they're angry for, for whatever reason. Maybe they're just angry because they don't... The, the, they can't see and don't experience God, you know, in the way that you do and, and see what's, what's happening. And they just get angry for, for, for morals and values and stuff that you stand for. And so this is what it says. He really killed the Jews and in the presence of his associates. So with everybody there and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? So he's angry. He says, he says you are just feeble. You are nothing, man. Will they restore their wall? Will they offer their sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Listen to how he puts it. Will they finish in a day? Never, nowhere do would you read Nehemiah says, we're going to finish these walls in a day. But here he comes and he says, he starts ridiculing them. And he just says, you know, will they restore it in a day? Are they capable of doing that? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? So, do you have the picture in your head? Here's a guy coming from Babylon. He served the king. He stayed in the palace. He had a good life, a comfortable life, moving with a compassion. How many of you know there's a difference between concern and compassion? You can, have, you can be concerned here but not do anything, and you can have compassion that drives you to do something about the situation. And now he comes with compassion and, and whatever. And now these people start ridiculing him and start calling him names and calling him out. And listen to this, verse 3. Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side. Now he's at the side of Sanballat. <laughs> How many of you know, some of these guys don't come alone, right? They, they need companionship. They need just somebody to, 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 to join in, you know. And, and then if you shout, then, then I'll shout, you know. So you shout first, and then, then I'll shout. And then he says, it was at his side, said, what are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. What you guys are standing for is feeble. What you guys want to see, what you guys want to establish, that which you guys want to build, oh man, even a fox will jump against it and it will just fall down. You guys don't have the power, don't the strength. What you are doing is a worthless work. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I stand for Christian values, when I stand for what God is doing, I sometimes feel like it. I sometimes feel like when people start ridiculing you for what you believe in, I just feel like, man, you know, it feels like, you know, this ridicule and this, it, it's, it's getting to me. And, and we will see this now. And now in verse 4, they start to pray. I know I read a lot, but I have to, I have to bring you into the, the, to the picture. Are, are you with me? Are you okay? Right? And he says, hear us, O God, verse 4, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Now verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. 
You, you've got you to you stay with me this morning just, just a little bit here. Sometimes we work with all our heart and we do everything we can. And we build with all our might. But it's only halfway done. You get what I'm saying? Sometimes we, we, we and, and I know you, know you still look at me with a confused face thinking, John, where are you going with this? Hang in there. But you have to know this. You have to get this, right? Sometimes you do everything you can that you believe God has told you to do. Sometimes you've put every effort in there and it's only halfway there. What I want to say to you is don't get discouraged. Do not get tired. Don't feel like Halfway done is there. No, 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 it's only halfway. And so they've worked with all their heart. Verse seven, but when Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to the Jerusalem walls had gone ahead. So they thought that their ridicule at the beginning would stop the work. They thought that, you know, telling them they are feeble Jews and if a fox jumps against it, you know, we'll just fall over, you know, they will stop. But these Jews just continued. They just continued to work and they worked with all their heart. Now it's halfway there. Now the work is halfway done, right? And now suddenly they hear again that the repairs of the wall had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed. They were very angry. Now, at the beginning, they were just angry and incensed, but now they were very angry. Why are these guys not listening to us? You know, why are they very angry? Now, listen to what very angry people do or do. I get my tenses wrong. It's your job to tell me your tenses are wrong. All right, so anyway, and they all plotted together to come and fight. So now it's not just ridiculing anymore. Now it's not just telling, now it's going over into action. Now it is, these guys are rebuilding their walls. They are building their wholeness, their security, their prosperity, the peace of Jerusalem. They are are gonna be a strong people again. Man, I I, I can't have that. So now they're going over to fight, right? And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a God day and night to meet this threat. Are you still with me? You're still with me in the story. You're still with me what's going on, right? Because the topic of the sermon, and I waited till now to share that with you again, is exposed places. Exposed places. Now, you've seen the the picture behind me when I started the story, but I didn't tell you what I was talking about. Exposed places. Listen to this. Verse 10. Now, meanwhile, the people in Judah said, right? Who, Who said? The people in where? In Judah. These are the people that Nehemiah felt compelled to go and help. These are the people that Nehemiah felt that God has laid upon his heart to go and restore the walls of Jerusalem because these people are crying, they are in trouble. So now he comes from his comfort zone and he comes to Judah and he starts to helping the people of Judah. Listen to what the people of Judah is saying. And they said, they just don't think this, they start speaking this. They say, the strength of the laborers is giving out. And there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. It's the same people that started building the wall and it's, it's halfway there already. They've put in all their heart. They've put in all their might. They've given everything they've got. Now it's halfway. And it's these people now who says, we're out of power. We're out of strength. There's so much rubble. We can't do it. Church, hear me out. The moment you stand for something, the moment you stand for what you believe in, it'll take every effort that you have 
The enemy will not stop ridiculing. The enemy will not stop ringing. Do not get tired. Do not look at still what needs to be done. Look at what, has, what God has done already. Remember how, what God has done already. And look at what God has done already. The wall is halfway built. And they said, and, and they started speaking and they start saying, the laborers are giving out. Also, our enemies said. So now it's not just the people of Judah speaking. It's not just the people that's tired speaking. But now the enemy is starting to speak. Now the enemy is starting to throw accusations. He says this, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and kill them and put an end to their work. So suddenly the people are tired. How many of you know the enemy knocks you when you're tired? How many of you know the enemy kicks you the moment that you feel like, man, I've given it everything I've got. I can't give it anymore. And now suddenly the enemy is just telling you that what you have built and what you've done and what God is doing is not good enough. We will attack you and we will kill them all and we will break everything down. And you feel like, what is it all worth? Isn't that true? Is it worth it to do all of this? Is it worth it in a world that we are living in today to stand for what we believe in? Is it worth it to to believe God that He can do a miracle in the midst of His people? Is it worth it to trust Him to uplift people and pick people up and restore that which was broken? Is it worth it? And so the enemy starts speaking. And then suddenly, then the Jews who lived near them. Near who? The Jews who lived near the enemy. The enemy, the people who lived near the enemy came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Hey! (laughs) Nehemiah, I think I would find, I came to help you guys. What are you doing? First you tell us that we don't have any strength, we can't build anymore. Then the enemy says you're gonna kill us. And now you guys, you tell us 10 times over. What, what is the main thing about a rumor? A rumor gets a tail. So, so if you start a rumor, right? If I want to start a rumor um, about Vico, I would say, you know, Vico, man, that hair, right? And I tell it to, to somebody. Somebody else goes and says, Vico, you know what John said about Vico's hair? He said it looks terrible. I didn't say it looked terrible. And then somebody else says, yeah, John said, his hair looks terrible. And then, you don't, your hair looks great, all right? I love you, son. You're awesome. But you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? So, so, so rumors, it gets little tales, right? And so, 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 so and then, now they tell us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Look at the person next to you very quickly and just say exposed places. Exposed places. You still don't know what I'm talking about, but that's okay. Because here is the crux of the matter. In verse 13, Nehemiah is speaking. He says, therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall and at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. Nehemiah, I think you've got something wrong, my friend. You do not put families at the most exposed places. You put warriors at the lowest points of the wall and the most exposed places. You put strong warriors there. Because why? It is the most exposed. Are you with me? Suddenly it's very quiet in this place. There's a reason for it. Nehemiah says, 
Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families. And I, and I really, literally, I had a look at these words, families, because I thought, maybe it means something else. Maybe it means, you know, you know the big tribes of soldiers or whatever. You know, maybe, maybe it's like legion. Maybe, maybe it's, it's a different. The word there is relatives. So what Nehemiah did was, he said, at the most exposed places, let's put the strongest form of defense that we can find. Get the families together. Put the families, the most exposed places where the enemy will attack. Get the families there. That the enemy cannot come in. That the enemy cannot come in and destroy what we are building inside. Have you ever wondered why the enemy's attack on your family is so fierce? Have you ever wondered why the enemy wants to destroy and rip apart families? Because they are the strongest form of defense when it comes to rebuilding a community and, and, and people and stand strong for security and show them what it means to have power. Why the enemy is attacking our families and focusing in on our children and focusing in on our marriages and trying to destroy. Why is it that he's putting, and putting ridicule and why is it that he's throwing accusations? Why is it that he's, that he's, that he's coming to fight against our families. The reason he's fighting is because they are standing in the most exposed places, standing and fighting for people who cannot fight for themselves. The most vulnerable of places. Nehemiah says, get the strongest people in there. Get the relatives, get the families. Let them stand. See, if you ever wondered, if the enemy is happy with your family unit, let me tell you straight out, he's not. If you ever wondered why does it take so much effort to pray, to be together, to stand together as a family, why can't it be easy? Why is it so difficult? Let me tell you why. Because you're standing in the most exposed places. You're fighting a battle. Just being a family. You're fighting a battle that the enemy does not like. Why do you think the enemy is so against families? To have strong, prepared families, we need to be intentional about it. If you want a strong family, you need to be intentional about it. It doesn't just happen. I can tell you that. As being in ministry for years, I can tell you, if I'm not intentional with my family, let me tell you, it doesn't just happen. We need to disciple our families. Discipleship church begins at home. Discipleship doesn't just happen. We need to be intentional about it. We want to see not just our connect groups. A few weeks ago, I talked to you about our connect groups and, and shown you, but we don't want just our connect groups, but we want our families becoming intentional discipleship making units. How do we do it? How do we do this? Well, the Bible is very clear. Read it with me in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 9. I love it, man. I love it. The first time I heard this was, was when Piet shared this. It was in Middleburg in South Africa, and he shared this, and it just read my heart. Listen to this. It says in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 9. Hear, O Israel. Listen to how he starts. The Lord our God. Listen, church. We serve a God who's not just your Savior, but He's also your Lord. Yes. It's His word or no word. Yes. There's no compromise in what He says. He's Lord and God. The Lord is one. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Do you get that? These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. What, is, what, is, what are the commandments? Love God with everything that is within you. Listen to what he says. He says, these commands I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. I looked at that word impress. Because sometimes we think it's, you know, I want to impress somebody. You know, like, you know, I want to talk nice. No, no, that's not what it says. That word impress is taking a form of something, press it so hard on something else, that when you leave it, the mark will stay there. He does not say, parents, when it is easy and comfortable, when you feel like it, when your child doesn't talk back to you, when your child is open and ready for it, impress this on them or, or give them as a suggestion. <laughs> eh? he, doesn't, he doesn't say, you know, Give them this way as well as the other. No. He says, impress it. He says, press it so hard that when you stop pressing, the mark will stay there. What mark? Press it on your children that to love God with everything that is within you. Then he says, talk about them. Do you remember when in the beginning I said, the enemy said, this and the enemy said that there is something that happens when we start to speak. There's something that happens when you start to speak over your children, over your family. There's something that happens when you open your mouth and you start to speak what you feel. Don't just think it. Speak it. Say it. The enemy is not ashamed to speak. Start speaking. And they say Talk about them. About what? About loving God with everything. Talk about them when you sit at home. Ah, uh, my child is in his room all the time. No, no, no. Talk about when you sit at home. When you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up. I don't see any time here where he allows us not to talk about it. I don't see any times here that we are together that we are not allowed to talk about what it means to love God. You see, but when I talk about it, I have to walk it. When my children look at me, they have to look at me and say, you, what you say and what you do, it comes together. I'm sad to say that there was a time in my own family when my family had to look at me and say, hey, what you're saying, what you're doing, doesn't, it doesn't come together. It was so bad in one state that Joshua now, who's our youth pastor and leading our youth, looked at me and said to me, I will never do what you do. He said, I will not be a pastor. And I had to reflect and I had to go back and say, Lord, what example am I setting? What discipleship making process am I following or am I implementing that my own son doesn't even want to do what I do? And I had to change that. Let me tell you, it's never too late to change. Yes. Yeah, maybe you need to preach that with me. Look at the person next to you and say, it's never too late to change. Come on. Come on. Because we feel like, oh man, it's halfway built and now I'm tired and I can't go on. I'm done. No. Change. It goes on to say, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. What he's saying to you is, tell everyone all the time, your whole family, every day, love God with everything you have. Stand strong. The world will try and give you substitutes continually for what to love and how to love with everything. It says, no, love God. 
God's intent for the family church is to be the main center of discipleship making. Parents are meant to be the chief discipleship makers. We, what parents do or don't do is more influential than the church when it comes to faith formation. We want to see parents taking the lead in discipling their children. You need to take the lead. What we're doing at the moment is from our kids' church to our, to our youth, we're sending out on Sundays afterwards, you will receive something that your young people have done in the kids' church or in the, in, the, in the youth so that you can talk to them about what they have discussed there. And you can look through it and you can see through it and you can either agree with it or you disagree with it and come and talk to us if you disagree with it. But that is not the main discipleship making center. The main discipleship making center is at home. So that our families can stand in the most exposed places. We want to see parents equip, equip to equip their children. I want to say this to you. If you don't know how, ask. Don't just leave it. Not everybody is born and, and raised and know how to disciple their children. Not everybody is born and raised and you know, knowing exactly what to do, how to disciple friends and family and relatives. Maybe you don't know. If you don't know, ask. Find out. Pray. See God's face. Figure out how do we do this? We want to see families, like in the time of Nehemiah, bringing hope and restoration and security back to people and to a community. But there's one thing you've got to note, and I'm closing with this. One thing you need to note, you are not alone in doing this. Can I ask you to preach with me one, more, more, one last time, to look at the person next to you and say, you are not alone. Because listen to what Nehemiah says. Listen to what Nehemiah says in Nehemiah 4 verse 14. He says these words. He says, after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid. When I read those words, the last four weeks of sermons, of preaching, just hit me. When Jesus looked at his disciples and said on the boat, don't be afraid. When Jesus looked at his disciples and, and when that man came running out, you know, with the demons, he looked at him and he says, don't be afraid. When he was on his way, you know, and Jairus came up and said, my daughter has died, he looked at him and he said, don't be afraid. Yes. We hear this again. I, it's, it's, I think it's a word for our Time. I think it's a word that Jesus is saying to us, stand strong, be strong, be courageous, be determined, do not be afraid. Nehemiah looks at these people and he says, do not be afraid of them, remember the Lord. Yes. Amen. I want to say to you this morning, in your strive to see your family be what God has called them to be, to stand in the exposed places, to stand strong, remember the Lord. Tell yourself continually, I'm not alone. The Lord is with me. Emmanuel is with me. God Himself is with me. Remember the Lord. What does He say? Who is great and awesome. Remember God, who's great. And awesome. And then he says this. And fight for your families and for your sons and for your daughters, for your wives and for your homes. Church, hear me this morning. If there is a fight, that in this week specifically, that I've decided that I'm gonna take up. It is a fight for families. It's a fight for relatives, it's a fight for people who are feeling down and out and they can't fight for themselves. Because I believe 
that when we see strong families, God is positioning us to stand in the most exposed places where the wall is at the lowest and stand and say, we are strong, we will fight and we will, we will block the enemy when he's trying to come for our kids and our community. As you know, discipleship is hard and it's demanding. So we have to remember that without the Holy Spirit, we cannot experience true transformation. Verse 15 says, When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God has frustrated it. Listen to how they put it. Listen to how Nehemiah puts it. He says, God has frustrated their plans. We all return to the wall, each to his own work. When the enemy heard that God has frustrated their plans, suddenly the strength returned to us. Suddenly we didn't say, no, we can't do this. Suddenly we said, yes, we can do this. We started building. You might sit here this morning and say, John, what are you on about? It's not enough for me. It's not enough for me to know that my family serves Jesus. I want to see a community coming together, serving Jesus. Therefore, I want to put my family in most exposed place and say, let's fight. Let's protect. Let's stand up for people who cannot stand for themselves. Let's speak the truth. Let's speak God's word. I want to ask you this morning. And hear me out. This is no judgmental. I told you that I've been through this. What in your family, what places in your family are still exposed? Did you as a parent, need to go and say, we're closing this gap. Here, we are standing. Is there some places in your family that's exposed, some places that you feel like, we need to ask God. We need to come together and ask Him and trust Him so that we can stand together. And He's there place that you can say, Lord, with your help, I'm going to make disciples, these people here, who can stand in the gap. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to ask you to put up your hand. I'm not going to make an invitation. I'm not going to make an altar call. I'm just going to pray for you. But each and every one of you know, in your own family, in your own home, what is God challenging you on? What is He asking of you? Are you impressing still on your family to love God with everything they have? Still impressing on them, still binding it on their heads. Still writing it on the doors, making sure that they know. So where you are, so maybe you just close your eyes. Maybe can I ask you just for just for 30 seconds to talk to God where you are? Maybe just for a few seconds to say, God, I want to impress. God, I want to make sure. Listen to what I say. Don't sit here this morning and say it's too late. It is never too late. You sit here and say, John, my children have grown up. What do I have to tell them now? What can I tell my relatives now? They've seen me for so long. It's never too late. Heavenly Father, thank you that I can pray. Thank you that I can pray for each and every one of us. 
who are experiencing what we've talked about this morning. That there's people, maybe with authority, maybe with power, ridiculing, trying to speak against, trying to break down what we believe you have raised. Father, I pray that you will strengthen our families. Father, I pray that you will strengthen people to say no, and we will impress on us to love God. And then we want to stand in the most exposed places and see you move and build and restore. The enemy has broken down and burned down. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.